This is Off Planet Radio. And we're back, segment two. This is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. We're here with Wolf Famous. And um, that last hour was uh, both a summary and kind of a, a, a gateway into some things that we're going to do in this segment, um, going into weaponized frequencies. But we're going to start off with uh, a few tales from our guests. Welcome back, Wolf Famous. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, I asked to put a few tales forward because one of the things within MK Ultra is that there is a certainly evidence of mind mapping, but also mind imprinting. And from my understanding, where I'm from, the area of the Druidic Lodge that I w was uh, exposed to is as a, a spur of one of, the, I think it's the fourth richest per lord in England, and his money goes back to the Opium Wars. And very close to us is a stone circle, and this stone circle is where these druids operate from. There's a village next door uh, with a very traditional name and has these dru uh, called the Druids Rocks. And again, we we as a local people. Um, we say, oh, you know what they're doing up on the moors, and you know what they do at the rocks. Well, when you go up to the rocks, you can see the stain upon the altar. Now, what is being sacrificed? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, and it may only be animals. I say only, but it may be animals. But it's certainly stained as though it's active. Now... It's a very dangerous topic, but something happened that that, that stunned me. And I, again, I can't get past what this was, whether this was serendipity or whether it was uh, mind control. But the tale goes like this. I, I, it was uh, about 11 o'clock one night. It was one of those blazing full moon nights. And I went outside and I was sort of pacing, actually, up the lane, thinking I could burn some energy off somehow. And as I went up the lane, my neighbours came down. And they would be just a little bit younger than me. And the girls all got out of the car and they were all blah, 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 and into the house. And a friend of mine is an Irish lad. He, he looked at me and I said, I said, do you fancy a walk? And he said, yeah, come on, let's go. So we just headed off. And I said, come on, let's go up to the stone circle. And we wandered off. It would be two miles maybe. And as we travelled, we... Um, we noted that the conversation we're having, you know, sometimes you can have a conversation with somebody and maybe you're fighting for the sort of superiority in the topic uh, and going against each other. But this wasn't like that. It was much more that we were just expressing two sides of the same tale of the same you know, uh, concepts that we were going through. And of course, the moon was shining down. It could see everything. And it was nearly midnight at this time, obviously. And um, so it was great. We were having a great time conversation we were young you know and um in our early 20s and um, as we as we got about halfway up just before we went on to the moorland where the stone circles uh, are we heard a car and i know this sounds strange but we we'd both noticed that the moon looked like a yin yang and this just added to the fuel of this this topic we were like what's going on now i assure you there was zero alcohol zero drugs it was just a really charged night and neither of us were into drugs and um, later on actually in my late 20s i explored a little bit of the party scene this when the acid house scene kicked off um but you know I mean, that's a wild thing altogether so this was in my early 20s i was much more sort of i just i'm just come out of college as an electrician i've been in the army for a few years so i'm i'm quite straight laced to be honest and so uh, my friend certainly was and um so, as I say, we got about <laughs> nearly up to the moor and we heard a car. So I looked at him and we heard it again. He looked one way, I looked the other. 
And then we heard it again. I looked the direction he'd looked and he looked the direction I looked. And then we looked at each other again. And all of a sudden we realized it was on us. So he stepped back to the other side of the road and I stepped back to my side of the road. And we were looking at each other across this road as two cars passed us exactly. And this yin yang, this dual nature of this, I mean, it's, it's a phenomenon at midnight, two cars from either side passing exactly on us i don't know what this is you know at this stage i'm looking at this guy and he's looking at me going what is going on so now we've got to remember that now years later i can see frequency based technologies much more clearly um it's some part of what we were trained in the army funnily enough but one of the things i realized is that this person was very 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 high powered this lord would have had access to that technology in the early 80s when this happened. He could have been some of the, you know, on, on sort of using this tech maybe for years before. It was, but certainly I now consider this not to be a um, cosmic intervention or maybe a combination of um, predicting this uh, uh, moon, a high powered moon, and using this technology alongside it is my opinion. So, this said, we, after that happened and there was this synchronized, I, I, we just shook ourselves and said, God, let's keep going anyway. And we jumped onto the moorland and we walked around the moorland. And as we got to the stone circle, we saw the 13 druids in the circle doing a ritual. Now, this wasn't unknown about that this was going on, but we had never seen it. Of course, being young, we'd, we'd just never seen it. And what what happened in honesty? In honesty, we came down and we sat down near the circle and we were just jabber, 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 jabber. Because that's how we got gotten there was in this conversation. Now, these druids stepped out of the circle and knelt down under a tree. And we were, we sort of regaled back into ourselves and thought, oh, we're being a bit disrespectful here. And maybe we should just shut up. So we did for maybe two, three minutes. And then they stood up again and went back into the circle. But without us having any real control over it, we immediately started jabbering again. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this aside, uh, jabber, 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 jabber. These druids stepped back out of this circle as in a stream and went behind this tree and each of them vanished. And they went and we can see everything on this moor. There's, there's only one tree and it's just bare moorland everywhere. So as the last one went past this tree, we jumped up. I went one direction. He went in the other direction around the, the, the stone circle and there was nobody to be seen. And of course, <laughs> now we're in shock and we're just looking at each other saying, look, we'll never talk about this. This is mental. <laughs> we're losing our minds. We just never tell anybody. And now looking back, the one phenomenon that still amazes me is there is no tree and I, I know that sounds strange but I, I, you can actually go to this stone circle on 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 on, um, on images and there are no tree there is no tree that was one thing that it took me about five years to realize because i hadn't gone back there for years till years later and, and i was looking for the tree and i was looking for the tree stump and i was like but there is no tree there was never a tree there and now we could say hologram imagery, we can say MK Ultra imprinted memories. I don't know. All I know is that that set of events occurred and my friend really never made it back. He, he still to this day is shook by it. And it, this is 30 years later, 30 odd years later. Uh, I, I, I hear tales back from my sister and he just can never really approach the topic because it, it stunned us both that much. Because I was military and because I was a radio operator, because I'm an electrician by trade, I've studied this. And because I work with um, mantra and I use a singing bowl, uh, I've realized the power of frequency. And of course, 440, 432 megahertz, all this vibrational technology and simple nature based frequencies are real. And actually, we're, we are constructed by these frequencies so I, I spent a lot of years now developing an understanding of what frequency is and eventually i came back to that tale and i said there has to have been something else 
it's not that I don't believe in a spiritual realm or that I don't believe in a uh, serendipity. I just all I know is that that was too much information for it to be real. And 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 I now I'll skip to about when my dad told me that it wasn't actually no, it wasn't when my dad told me about uh, he regretted my um, me being having satanic influences in my life. It was much more recently, actually, in the last few months. And uh, I told him this tale. No, probably never told him before. And uh, he looked at me and he went very quiet. It's not unheard of with Scorpios. They, they tend to do that. And he just looked and he just very quietly said, that happened to me 20 years before you. And I said, pardon? He said, when you were a baby, he said, me and the neighbour, uh, who's a Druid, a uh, Freemasonic Druid, um, we went up the mall and they used to have beach buggies. It was the 60s and they had beach buggies and this kind of thing. And uh, we went up in the beach buggies, he said, and uh, we just went across the moors to see the Druids. And I said, really? He said, yeah, he said, but they did exactly the same when we got there. He said, we sat down and they got out the circle and walked across the moorland. And where they went this time was a little pathway about 100 metres off. He said, so we sort of chased after them to see where they went because they just vanished, he said. And there was a cliff. And I know what he means. And he said, there's mm. no way they could go anywhere. There was a cliff there. 40, 50 foot cliff. So, you know, these two s tales I, I, I've sort of told because I'm not convinced that this is a mystical druidry. I think it's a combination of a possibly some underground. Um, uh, there's a lot of underground caverns in where I'm from, a, a lot. And there's a lot of history in those caves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, mm -hmm. We, we, have, uh, we had um, Hell's Angels living in these caves. Mm -hmm. We had uh, troglodytes. They were one of the uh, Hell's Angel gangs. Uh, they, we have the Druids where we are. Uh, we have the troglodytes. And who's the other ones? But, I mean, troglodytes in the Bible were cannibals. When you study in the Bible, it, that's what the troglodytes were. And the, so, the, the, again, the, we have this uh, weaving of these traditions and this technology. And I genuinely think it was a, a meandering of both. Um, and so that was one one tale that I, I cannot doubt wasn't uh, somewhere in the middle. And have another one which was in the same vein. And this again, I, I cannot quite, but it, it totally influenced the whole the future of my life. And so I wake. I, I came back from Holland and um, I was staying in my sister's room and there was no bed in there. I was on the floor, and in this dream. I'll be honest, it's a dream. I sit upright in the dream. And as I sit upright, I can sense the classic. I mean, we hear this a lot, the UFO abduction. But this was a, a, a UFO. I could sense it. So I look behind me in this dream and it was a big grey saucer out the window. <laughs> so it, it, it came up and it went over the house and it landed in the back garden. And in this dream... I get up and I go into the hallway and I look out the back window and there it is in the back garden. And in the sky was just a motorway in every direction of these crafts is the only thing I can call them of all shapes and sizes. So immediately I'm back in the bed again or on the floor in the bed sat up and um, a tall, dark, grey being entered the room yeah, and it attacked. Yeah attached itself to the side of me. And so in one moment I lean forward to get up and then immediately I sit back down in a long thin chair in a blue grey room. I mean, these are, I've heard this tale online of, in a few different places, very similar. So as this occurs, I'm sat in this blue grey room with, uh, with these three or four, I forget if it was three or four of these tall grey beings and um, they were like shadows actually and um, this, the temple this, the, the nerves in my temple I had my head to the side were jumping and they were popping and there was obviously something occurring in this dream that was like uh, a, another form of mind control perhaps but as I, I was trying to I suppose you're always trying to regain in a dream you're always trying to regain your sense of rationale and, and reality you know you, you see the pic, you see what you're looking at and then you think well what's that to do with real world sort of you know you try and bring it to the real world somehow 
And as I was doing this, I could see on the ceiling and it just said fresh water written in water. And as I'm looking at it, 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 it just corroded. It just just dispersed. And as I'm sat there, I realize I'm in my sister's bedroom, sat upright, looking at the ceiling and exactly the same position as when the dream started. So I kind of blink and I rub my eyes and think, Jez, that was a crazy dream. That is the most poignant dream I've had in years. But what was it about? I mean, you know, what was it about? <laughs> I'm back visiting my parents from work I was doing abroad and I was just visiting and what does, what's this about? So as I left and I put my head into my what was essentially my bedroom, my dad had got us an office and I said, morning, dad. And uh, I said, just, I just had a crazy dream, knowing I couldn't disturb him because he was busy. And uh, he said, oh, he said, I thought you'd gone out a couple of hours ago. And I was like, no, no. And my mum had a little cabin next door. So I went down and I went next door to see my mum and she was doing her hair. And I sat down, a cup of tea, and I said, hey, mum, God, you should have had this dream. And she said, OK. And so she started telling her, well, <laughs> as the hair started burning, as I'm telling her, I said, Mum, she goes, you would not believe what happened to me last night. So she, I told her my tale and she said to me, now, my mum's a very straight lady. She is, because I think of certain experiences in her life, she, she, you know, she is a very straight lady. She's a teacher and she, this sort of thing is just crazy. She said, I, I, what I dreamt was uh, to set the picture where we are uh, every night. There are at two o'clock every night. There are four Royal Mail planes travel over a valley and the uh, propeller so it's a, a particular drone that they make and um, she said um, and it's every night 365 days a year these four planes go over and she said I could hear this drone and she said all of a sudden I woke up because that happens at two and she says I remember listening to it as I was going to sleep and this must have been much later she said the moment I woke up and I opened my eyes, the room was full of light. And there was this push noise. Everything went dark. She says, in the moment it happened, I knew what it was. I would never have told you. I would never have remembered if you hadn't told me that story. And I just looked at her and I just shook my head. She goes, I don't know what that's about. It quite scared my mum. She, she does talk about it, but she, she tries to keep it at a distance because it's unexplainable. But years and years later, I'm looking at this um, frequency based technology, this idea that they can project, they can predict, is another way to put it, certain fundamental potentials in the mind that we would be susceptible to and encourage them. Now, Goebbels had all the organs mapped for frequencies in 36, I believe it was, by... 85, what's to say they hadn't, or 83, they hadn't got the actual intellectual uh, frequency for um, delusions of any kind, depending on your character. I'm sorry, but now I genuinely think if they've got it woven to music that these high elite families like I was around, they had it. They, they knew how to trigger certain things and certain illusions in people's minds and of course the ufo abduction one is a classic it's not like i'm the only one i ignored it for years because I, well i didn't ignore it i just thought it was nuts but my mum had proved there was some other dimension to it that i didn't understand and you know and only now am i looking at in the last five years going it has to be it has to be another vein of mk ultra and their ability to imprint potentially things into people's minds. It's not just through propaganda in the media and all these types of it, that there's a very, very highly refined version for their personal whim. And the personal whim, as we've said before, was the, the predating of my family and also the disposing of any negative baggage <laughs> that may come along with it. Now, to finish that tale, um, what happened was I went back to Holland, of course, thinking much more of it than you do as a big as a dream that had this other side to it and I got there and I, some friends came back from India and they were on the street and I noticed them and they had all these crates 
and I, and I and I said, "Are you all right?" And they said, "Oh, we've just come back from India, and we can't get a flight home." And I was like, "What are you going to do?" Because they had a good few of these crates. And I said, "Do you need somewhere to stay for a night whilst you get together what you're doing?" They said, "Oh, please, yeah, would you?" Now it was very trusting. Holland's not a. It's not. It's a, not, It's not entirely safe, but they seemed okay. So lo- luckily they were smashing folk, and uh, we brought them in. And within a couple of hours we got chatting and he, and he said to me he said what are you doing here and I said actually do you know I've lost my job from being away actually I said I've lost my job and I'm just not quite sure what direction to take and he said did you ever go over to Ireland and I said to Ireland no I haven't I said tell you what he said I'll pay for the fuel I'll pay for the ferry will you bring us home <laughs> I said all right then and that's what exactly what happened and great time it was a brilliant journey but as I landed in the south of Ireland off the ferry, I drove up maybe four miles out of, uh, I think it was Ro- Ross Lair is the harbour, about four or five miles, and you go past this beautiful lake, and of course, Ireland's tremendous, it's pure green. And uh, I'd never seen anything like that. I mean, where I come from is beautiful, but that's yeah, stunning. And uh, all of a sudden, fresh water came back. I could see it again in front of my eyes. I felt like the Pope. I had to pull over and get out and touch the ground. And, and, and this image of fresh water and this lake and all these beautiful green fields, it was very obvious that somewhere along the line, I was questioning, I was too critical thinking, I was going up against these pedophiles I hadn't mentioned about um, that was in the, 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 the town in this cinema. I wasn't playing ball with that. I wasn't playing ball with a number of things around Druidry that I was a pain in the butt, to be honest. Yeah, and that, actually, general, that actually that actually came up in our first in our interview first, together. Yeah, well, that was it, and and I think this tale is what brought me to that place, and said, "Get over there, get out of our face, and and heal, do something else." So these two tales, I think, while seemingly sort of astral based or some kind of spirit, I don't think they were. I, I think they were frequency-based MK Ultra technologies. And however negative they might appear, that there's positives to them. There's, there's ways in which this technology can be utilised for the benefit of people. And so, again, uh, the great spirit, if you like, the creator or whatever, later on, a few years down the line, uh, my sister was in China, a Shaolin temple, and she came into the town. She went into, a, uh, I think it was an antique shop, and she found... She just saw this Tibetan singing bowl, which must have been stolen, and I got it. So she said it was mine. Immediately she saw it, she said, I must bring that back um, for myself. And over these, I've been using this singing bowl. And a little bit later, if we have a little bit of time, I might just uh, explore by using it so people can hear the pitch perfectness of it. Um, And I genuinely think that these are... Are, are a sequences of of reality you cannot have one without the other so any negative that we may have thrown at us if we keep our ears and eyes and uh, critical thinking open that if you like god or the creator or whatever it is about life reflects another version of the same thing and i think it's designed this way this is why i don't always go up against these these bad systems and people because with every one of those there's two or three positives that are around that to counter it whether it's conscious whether it's deliberate it doesn't really matter i think there's a i think there's a a natural balance that occurs in 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 reality and so what we're coming into now um is the 5g era you know the internet of things and the frequency-based technologies that they want us to interface with are what they were exploring with the likes of myself years ago and possibly my dad in the 60s that's how far back it goes um so th- again we're, we're, we're probably refreshing some of the things that were said before so yeah th- th- these th- those two tales have held very very close and i've now come around a big circle and so I can see them. so do you believe, do you believe that, that uh, i'm getting a lot of echo here um don't know what's going on with that. Uh, do you believe that that was a sound frequency that triggered 
that UFO gray experience? Is, is that what what you're getting at here? You know, I, again... And the reason I'm asking is because this is so common. I mean, this, the history of the show goes back to two things. UFOs and MK Ultra. We have bounced back and forth over this subject for a decade now. And that's part of my experience as well. And what you describe there in that experience is something that I experienced several times. And there are some very significant frequencies that attended those experiences. Well, I mean, there was something popping in my temple. You know, something mm. jumped. So, so even within the dream, there was some kind of programming going on. So we could say that is physical. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it could be targeted, physical, frequency-based experiences. To make, excuse me, to make certain thoughts appear, I'm starting to question whether shows, TV, movies, I think, if I, I, I was in, I've done mu music um, uh, 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 studio work, and of course, you expand and compress, and you do all these techniques to, and you can do it in reverse, and you can actually hear I slowed down some acid house tracks and I did not like what I was listening to. I mean, they were evil, genuinely evil. Now, I've got other dance music and <laughs> not of it's in there. But if you do certain things, you can tell that they're imprinting things with particular frequencies and actual. Some of it was torture. So like I, one of the so, things that um, Emily Moyers talked about repeatedly since she came on the air with me has been her experiences with um certain times types of electronic house music mm. and she'll probably tell me i got this wrong because I, I suck at categorizing techno house music and and things but she talks about these recurrent geometric patterns that she gets behind her eyes and that she sees when she's experiencing this when she's dancing is yeah. in is that something that you've experienced is that something that you kind of understand comes with a certain type of music so if we're if well, I, I think it's in all music i don't think it actually matters what music it is i think but there's certainly they produce different uh, in, uh, visuals you know the old experiments where they were putting even words and sounds into uh, frozen water yeah yeah it would produce Emoto, Dr. Emoto, yeah well, we're ninety percent water, or I'm sure it's as much as that. But it's, it's we're a lot of water, so behind the eyes would certainly give a translucent mm -hmm. a, a ability to see water shaping into particular forms through frequency music. So why not? Um, and if they can go that much deeper uh, and project actual thoughts, what I, what I, what I'm thinking is maybe if you watch uh, something on telly with ufos in there that they can underlie it with a a sub bass frequency, frequency or a high, yeah. some of one or the other um that maybe they can then reproject at you at a different time without the tv screen which then brings forward that memory which can be used as a, as a as a direction sequence of you know to direct you or to give you the idea that you experience this so it's a form of, of steerage through MK uh, mind control. So, See, yeah. I, and all of that is within my realm of experience. And my thought has been, well, there's a number of thoughts, because I was so young when I experienced some of this stuff. Um, I have a memory of specific frequencies. Could I replicate them? I have a synthesizer here in front of me. I, I've played around with this trying to get the frequencies and the harmonics of exactly what it is I've heard. I've heard it already in musical tones, but it's fleeting, it's very brief. But the sustained tone or harmonic that came in with the UFO ET abduction experience is very specific. My thoughts on this have largely been that tone itself is the introduction to the opening of some kind of gateway into what we would call a parallel dimensional reality, which allows this to occur. That we're merely maybe stepping aside, 
who knows, a, 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 a millimeter in, in our reality where we step into this, this, this parallel dimension. Because that's what it always felt like to me. So I never thought of it so much as an induction. But then again, uh, you know, I'm thinking about it. And I'm thinking about, you know, the discussions that we've had about what's called my labs, military abductions, and how it seems like this became part of a very large narrative uh, from the 1940s forward, where all of a sudden we started to get these, and especially in the 1960s, where we began to get these type of abductions that had a very specific narrative to them. So in all of that, I'm just thinking the frequency itself is a tell of something that's going on. I'm not willing to say that what you, I, we experience is necessarily an hallucination, but maybe an induction into some sort of parallel dimensional reality. So I think you're right. Uh, I think we've got two things. I've, I've, I've say this very quickly. Silent weapons. For quiet wars ah yes you know you only have to go anybody who's listening to this right now whether you believe entirely what william cooper talks about but well, please go and get yep, beyond exactly. a pale horse because beyond a pale horse gives you a, a, a number of documents a number of uh, things that you can easily reference and one of the first ones is silent weapons for quiet wars and I think it's based on this technology now what I'd like to also do is go back another 50 or 100 years even so even two three hundred years because what we had is that during the opium wars we had something that allowed people to have an astral experience now would anybody out there wants to think about astral projection I don't personally ex- want to experience it I think we we can use thoughts and, and we can use it uh, for communication, if you like, telepathy. It's this very similar area. But the, one of the things is, I think, through opium, from what I understand of people who've taken opium, they say you access the astral plane. And so if you think over time, maybe they have weren't worked out that frequency as well whereas they can and my mom experienced it let's face it that noise that she was experiencing of these four planes that she thought it was like a drone like a well that noise is hypnotic and it just happened that it was four hours after it should have happened and she twigged and so it was the same hypnotic same uh, ability to, to 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 do something to the mind and so i think that the astral plane is accessible and i think this is half the reason these uh, uh, cult groups are succeeding so well right now is because they're able to access it and i think they're able to affect people and even without the technology and and i mean that i mean you only have to go to india and spend time there um and spend time with tribal people and it's very obvious that there's another dimension as you say that is accessible and it's subtle. Um, I've learned over the years because I was brought up as a healer, as a natural faith healer. As a child, I was sort of introduced to it as an te- early teenager. And it's subtle. You don't, it's no big bones on it. You, you don't have to do too much. There's no dancing around with feathers. It's, it's a very subtle thing. And your thoughts is what manifest it. And so I think that maybe because of the opium era, and its accessibility in society until the 1900s, that people kind of had it as a tool, whether it was to <laughs> go to sleep for a couple of days to get a rest or whether it was to, 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 to do this shamanically. And I think this is what was going on. So we've then jump ahead a few years. I think they're I think they're forcing people into that astral realm through technology. It might not be the same astral realm, I'll grant you, but it's something within the mind. It's something within the communication of the mind the telepathy that we've we've talked about has that's left they're re-establishing it not just through opium but also now in this age through frequency based technologies and of course as we know everything is weaponized silent weapon for a quiet war and i'm sorry to say that i do believe in this age right now society is under attack 
from a very different angles. It is the Third World War, and it's it's a silent war. That's my opinion. Um, you know, it's that, interesting that you bring up the um, the opium. And if you look where we're at right now, we have this. We now have this generation of opiates or opioids, correctly, which are oh, yeah. synthesized opiates. Yes. And and it's it's an, it's an epidemic, it's especially insane. here in the United States. I mean, now they're finally starting to crack down on it. But we literally have a population in the Western world that became addicted to these things. And well, I've so used them. Know, what about you could affect them more with those opioids? I mean, I've experienced it. I, I had oxy <laughs> I had oxycontin uh, recovering from surgery about six years ago. Believe me. I cut these things in thirds. I used them as sparingly as possible. I used cannabis more than I used that Oxycontin just because of how fearful I was of it and because of how I felt on them. Well, there, was, that, there is a frequency fine. in these drugs. There's a frequency in these drugs. Of course. You can is. feel Especially it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I don't know what heroin's like. I, I As a kid... I, I lived during a time when there was a heroin epidemic. I saw people go into it. I stayed away from it. Mm. So I don't know exactly what a pure opiate experience is. Heroin itself is, you know, diluted and cut. So I don't know, but I can tell you that the opioids scare the living hell out of me. You see, it's, it's a little bit like a processed food. Yeah. The body, but the body deals with it as a toxin because it doesn't recognize it. It doesn't understand the carbohydrate profile, actually, is what happens when you eat a food that's a processed food. And opium, in its heroin or anything that's refined, the body will take it in and utilize it, but it's a toxin. And so it deals with it as a toxin. If you take, I would imagine, the, the, just the natural opium, I think what they do is they take off the top and there's a little bit of a sap or they score it, don't they? And there's a sap comes from it. That is a totally natural product that if you consume that, which is what, of course, people were consuming until they started to refine it, that one early absolute primal opiate is probably harmless on a lot of levels. And I believe it, it, it takes you into the astral plane. Once you start to concentrate it, the body starts to deal with it more and more and more as a toxin. So you imagine heroin is a thousand times stronger than that. The, the, I mean, it's just, you know, and Oxycontin, again, is that, that extra, all these new opioids. So they're not even, the body's not even able to receive them as a natural product any longer, just as a toxin. I mean, they were, look, it's not an accident. The CIA was running, they've been running heroin since the 60s. They were running mm -hmm. China, White, China White out of the Pacific Rim during Vietnam, literally, literally putting bags of China White into the cadavers of That's U.S. True. servicemen coming back. This was a weaponization of a culture. Um, did you ever read a book called Dope, Inc.? I remember this book, yeah. Very, uh, he's a very famous... Uh, what's his name now? He's a, he's no. a famous commentator of the this last 50 years. He may have even died there a few years ago, a couple of years ago. No, he's, he's referenced by a lot of alternative media. Um, but that particular book is upgraded every few years to give more ex uh, examples of exactly what you're saying, that the governments and the military have been smuggling drugs, and he goes back to the Chinese wars, and he shows how they do it. And they actually do it through um, spoiled goods. So at sea, things get damaged or taken off the sides, and then they're smuggled in, not smuggled, I should say, they're actually brought in as spoiled goods, and so they're, they don't have any customs checks. They're just for disposal. <laughs> That's what they've been doing. The book's uh, listed. Uh, it's interesting. This book's listed as Dope Inc. Britain's Opium War Against the World by Executive Intelligence Review. Yeah. So it's not giving an author. He'd be in his 70s even now. Um, mm. Hmm. It may come to me yet by the end of the show if I remember it springs to mind. But he, he's he's a very famous commentator in 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 Lyndon London. LaRouche. In Lyndon LaRouche. Lyndon LaRouche. Why did I not yes. know that? Yes, yes. Lyndon yes. LaRouche. Yes. And again, you know, there's a lot of things against. I was looking at the publisher here, so that makes sense. Uh, and executive uh, intelligence is Lyndon yeah. LaRouche's publishing yeah. arm. Yeah. 
<laughs> and he said he had to keep updating it every five to ten years because there's just new stuff coming out. Yeah, uh, you know. stopped. <laughs> so what we've got is an opium ad- epidemic uh, globally that has frequency-based technologies woven into it because, again, it makes us malleable and supple and, you know, music does the same perhaps on some levels. It vibrates us into a more receptive to this technology. And it's a long-term project. If they can get us into a position with 5G that we cannot no longer control our own perception and our own direction, that is the subtlest form of mind control and slavery and of one. I'm not even sure if it is possible to, to pull back even at this stage, just because I'm looking at it and I'm saying, well, you know, you have to live in extreme places n- n- not to, to be influenced by this. Um, so it's, it, that, that's one side. It's a negative side, I realise. But, it, well, it, it, but it's not only it, that. We live in a fishbowl. We live in a resonance field. When you affect, especially if you're using scalar technology, when you begin to affect the harmonics of the human biology, that resonance field, even with people who may not be directly affected, are affected by it in a resonance field. And it's not lost on me that once you begin to hit saturation level with this, you've basically reached critical mass on something that affects the entire or the greatest mass of humanity. Oh, it's, I mean, it's kind of concerning because there's a generation coming through with these frequency phones and, and, and technologies and they haven't, you know, they're, a, I'm not even saying I'm not as well because I'm on Facebook and I know that I probably go on far too much because of my page, yep. I'm seeing it and I'm trying to develop it and I'm learning and YouTube is the same, we're learning sure. and we're down. And it's addictive, and to be honest. It is addictive and when you take it away, it's a loss. You feel kind of maybe there's something missing. Now we have to be conscious about detoxing from it, I believe. And that's my opinion. I'm, I'm going to have to go into a detox at the moment from it, just for a few days, just to remember that, 50, no, what is it, 20 years ago, I didn't have any of this. If no, no, we, I grew up, the predominant part of my life was spent pre-internet, pre-mobile phones, pre-digital technology. I mean, uh, the first computers were nothing like the computers that we got in the 1980s. I mean, I, I programmed some of those computers. But now we're in what I call the flat screen era. I, I've literally made it a verb. I'm saying that people are being flat screened by this mm-hmm. technology. They're being flattened to the point where they are controlled emotionally, mentally, in terms of their own body and the harmonic that's going on there and the resonance patterns right down to the cardio level. We're seeing people that are experiencing anxiety and depression largely as a result of exposure to uh, digital media, whatever it is. Well, the, the, there's a number of issues there, isn't there, that when the sun goes down, mm, uh, yes, just Go as there. the sun goes down, there's a certain light frequency mm-hmm. that we now miss. Now, I spent 10 years without any technology because I was on sabbatical in a, in a, in a, in a, in a remote place, and I decided to take away all technology. This is when I was really kind of in my thirties, and I, I'd, because I was an electrician, I'd gone through all the technolo- technological stage in my life, and I just wanted to know, a bit like now being a non-occultist, what it would be like to have absolutely zero. Now, this is really before I knew a lot of stuff as well, but I'd, t- I'd taken that decision. I was with somebody who was the same, and we we had goats, and we had children, and a garden, and we just decided to have very little else. Actually, it was great, and okay, it was a, it was a period, and it was an era, but. I just always remember it and always remember thinking what 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 not not many people get that opportunity to just not have any technology for a long period of time. So I feel very blessed to have had that, that particular experience and to say I watched the sun go down for maybe 10 to 12 years and had that light spectrum. And it's I forget what it's called now. It's it releases release serotonin or is it melatonin? No, melatonin. It's one of those two, and it's the happy drug. And uh, so they're now suggesting that an LED light um, is doing something similar 
to the body, but it's not a positive version of the same. It's given as this uh, serotonin release, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's the LED. And it's the flicker of it, it's the color spectrum, the blue light of it, and it's very similar, but obviously not a, as, as... So anybody who's listened to this now, what I'd like to do is give a few tips. And if you just a feeling that you've got yourself hooked into, into computer land, just turn it off just before sunset and go and sit on the porch with the kids and just watch the sun set. You may not even be able to see the sun, but just go and let it go dark. You will feel so much better. You'll feel that power of it, and you'll 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 not want the computer on for the evening. You perhaps go and do something else. But it's, there's something else happens in that light spectrum, and it is true. It releases a happy content, not happy, a content drug into the body naturally uh, that we all need. I and mean, every animal does it. Every creature on this earth has that experience, and I genuinely had it for about twelve years, and. I do it sometimes now. I should do it every evening with the kids. I don't, and and probably after this topic, I, it'll maybe think more of that as a, important because it's a way of deprogramming from this frequency-based reality that we're absorbed into. Uh, there's a number of techniques that I'm, I'm over the years I've, I've thought. Hmm. Another one I mentioned at the end of the last show was medicine wheel from the Hopi Indian, mm -hmm. um, and. I'd like to offer another one here at this point. It's probably not an apt moment. The singing bowl that my sister gave me, um, I have in front of me, Randy, and if you would indulge me, I'd like to just give two minutes. And before I do that, one of the things in the East that they use is mantra. And mantra is nothing other than a series of repetitions and a series of syllables. And, and frankly, I think most people do it wrong. I know that sounds pro arrogant, and it was took a few years to 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 realise that it was aimless, and and that's why I couldn't really hang around in temples. I couldn't really be this way with these people because it it seemed aimless. Even around Buddhist monks, now we're very blessed with a monastery near us, and but it was still aimless. It was, and I just said that's not what it's about. So I started developing a technique of a uh, medicine wheel, use utilizing some uh, Qigong uh, stretch techniques in symmetry, in repetitions of three, and using a uh, mantra, uh, just long drawn out drones and things like this. And over time, I started to recognize that these f drones that we use are frequencies. And so instead of on tara tutari turis vaha on tara, this repetitive nonsense, I started to draw it out. And this is how I found, now there'd be a Buddhist, some Buddhists out there, I'll be saying, who's this dude telling us how to do it? And that's fine. If they get great resonance at what they do, that's great. For me, I, f I realized that I needed to talk this. I needed to, I need to put some passion into it. This mantra I use is called the Tara mantra, and it's uh, celebrating the goddess. But it's also celebrating her in three different forms. And so to the Celts, this is the maiden, this is the mother, and this is the old crone. And if you take the symbol of the Om, it has this three sort of aspects to it. Well, we have something called the Triskel, which is the same as an Om. It's three spirals. And one represents the, uh, the daughter, the maiden. Uh, another represents the mother. And then the third one is in reverse, There's like a double ring, and that represents the old crone, as we call it, in the kelp. And so I'd like to just share with you, just very, very briefly, it doesn't take too long. Tara 
Tutara, tutari, turi, swaha. Umtara, tutari, turi, swaha. Umtara, tutari, turi, swaha. Um, shanti. 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 Umtara, tutari, turi, swaha. Umtara, tutari, turi, swaha. Umtara, tutari, turi, swaha. Om Shanti 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 Now the, 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 the the reason I brought those about is if anybody is interested in vibration, in the accumulation of a different frequency in the physical body, and you feel that you're stiff, if you're immobile, mentally and physically immobile, just spend a little bit of time. Um, my wife and I have both had, uh, we had home births, and the last baby, my wife said, I want to do it on my own. This is the sixth one. I want to do it on my own. And after six babies, you sort of, okay, if you want to do that, girl, I'm going to have a snooze. You're kind of a veteran at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, okay, you know, it's safe enough. And uh, so, no, she wouldn't be quite into mantra like I am. I, I don't use it a lot, I'll be honest. It's just something that has come my way and I, I like to use now and then. And um, so, well, if you study childbirth, there's a certain part of childbirth in the contractions phase where women moo and they go, mmm. and I think it's the mantra. It's, mmm. it's the same as I was just doing there. It's this, mmm. so, and she said, I couldn't believe it. So the moment I started to deeply grunt and moo, just these long drawn out moos, the cervix opened like a door and she said I now understand why you do mantra now I do it in this as I said to you before is a qigong move which is a I think it's called um, something to the sun it's like a, um, a praise to the sun I forget the term and you you draw up from the ground and you bring it through your energy centers as they say and offer it up to the heavens and you bring down from the heavens what is essentially to come to earth so that you connect in between the earth and the heavens and back to earth so this is a very simple stretch it's, it's more all it is actually is a stretch and there's a number of other sort of side movements and and, and twists of the hips and you do everything in symmetry and repetitions of three well i i started to do it with mantra and all of a sudden these um this is really interesting this was that aches in my body that came apparent as i focused on them and sort of stretched them out something was coming to mind and in my mind was something i had a conflict over and it wasn't once it wasn't just twice it was literally each time i found an obstacle in my physical by the time i'd freed it up i realized i'd just counted something and considered something in my mental so I, I found this connect it was the connection between this mantra and this stretch mechanism and breathing exercises was part of the mantra so you're using a breathing exercise and on the out breaths using a little bit of this sort of and another one is hum and they worked I was I was dropping off all this tension so simple now I look at 5G, now I look at frequency-based mind controls, I'm, 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 I'm guessing that this is why I, I woke up, because I didn't harbour it in, in my cellular body, I was letting go of it through these techniques. That's my opinion. And, and I, I feel... I have to tell yeah. you, when you were doing the uh, bowl and the toning, and I'm sitting here in a studio room with a pair of pretty good high quality Sennheiser ear earphones on. 
um, you released a whole lot of things at that moment for me. That was phenomenal. Mm. I'm glad for you. you said, I, I, I found myself projecting it. Um, where I, I have this empathy towards children having delivered six, or well, I say five, <laughs> but I've been in witness to see six children being birthed when I see a child that seems stressed. Mm. And it does happen. You know, all mums and children go through phases of whatever. I'm, I'm on the market, so I see a lot of mums and babies and children. And uh, I don't make a big bone of it. I just, for the split moment, I, I just, ah, uh, oh, Shanti. 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 And you see the ch face change on the child and the dynamic between them just alters. No, I kind of don't like to say it and because I don't like to blow magic out of a window, if you like, or blow smoke up my own what's it. But it, it literally, I've seen it so many times that I don't even think about doing it now. I've done it in three seconds, five, ten seconds, and I move on in my life anyway. But it does work. And so if one person like myself can be doing this, what if people start finding this technique of not just mental vibrational projection, but also just learning to be able to find a way to help each other. Think, when, about, we, think about the implications of this even in terms of adopting this into birthrights again. Oh, wait, the birth trauma is a huge cause of mental health issues in the Western world. We don't do birth right. We take children to the clinical hospitals. We drug the mother. Now... And this just came up. It's interesting. We're talking about this. This came up. Uh, we have a monthly group Patreon chat. And last month we had mm, maybe 25 people in the chat. But uh, one of the members there brought up this this rage now over doing the cesarean section. It's not even elective surgery anymore, but how they want to do birth. And so the child's basically coming into a world in a state of trauma. And yet mm -hmm. Oh. A, a form of trauma and then without the stress and the, the mm. tri actual deliverance through a tight birth can, canal out into a world uh, where the heavens are a particular position mm -hmm. that penetrates exactly that that's where this goes that's exactly where it goes you could see of those heavenly bodies projecting into that so the child has never got the initial trauma but has the violent trauma of slashing and blood and mother's tra numbness and it's a complete contrast uh, i often say to people who ask me about childbirthing because obviously a lot of people go wow that's interesting now you know what, what do you say and i say you know you show me one of the, cr uh, the creatures on this planet that goes to a place of illness with bright light complete strangers and is birthed into this it's 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 actually proves a lot of about the insanity of the human mind uh, whereas and genuinely i mean this to everybody who's hearing who feels akin to this go do it on your own my wife proved that somewhere dark every time nice and quiet little candle on quiet birth no screaming baby comes out and smiles within a moment of being born each of my children looked at me with their eyes and just smiled as if to say, hi, I'm here. Like they'd just come back from the shop or school yeah. or whatever. It was beautiful. How different that is than that whole first thing that you hear is the baby crying and the trauma and the glaring lights. And, you know, this is kind of a sidestep, but I want to go here for a minute. Because mm. not only do we not birth well in this culture, we don't die well either. <laughs> and, and and it's come up enough in conversations, but it's been something that, that I've entertained for a number of years because I'm, I'm at the point where, you know, I've buried both of my parents and my wife's parents, and we've watched, you know, the last hours, minutes of people we love's lives. And again, it's not lost on me when I was sitting here listening to these tones of how powerful this is. We're, that we enter and we exit this world with grace and with a sense of serenity and harmony. I mean, I, you know, the, the birth, death traumas are not accidents. They've introduced this into our culture. Mm, definitely. 
and, and places where we're blocked in, you know, where we, we're... Well, I think it has some... I think it has something to do with even the amnesia that we've experienced between lives and why we come in and we don't have memory and why we come in and we're targeted. We've mm -hmm. been scrubbed and basically reprogrammed like so many microchips in, in, in a fab. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to throw something else out there. I always I, I like this one. I and mean, this is something I've kind of brought up as a as a as a concept. And when we die, you know, the idea we have, we go to the light. We hear this a lot. And this mm -hmm. idea in the Buddhist that we um, that we go to a bardos state, uh, yeah. which is a a hell realm, mm -hmm. and it's a fiery hell realm. And it's a lot of our preconceptions and our delusions being annulled. Now, I'm, I'm a big believer in earth, air, fire and water because it's, it's everything. You know, everything in the physical world is earth, air, fire Absolutely. and water. Yep. And a combination thereof. And there, you cannot have one missing. So when we study the idea that our uh, body, as part of our body leaves at the point of death in the last breath, I think it's so many grams. I think mm -hmm. this is real. And I think what happens is as you leave the body, these X amount of humid based uh, um, self, I think within that humid humidity is emotion. So it's, it's our emotion and possibly because there's air within that, it's our logic. As part of our soul, which is our emotion body and our logic body, goes out of our body. And I think as it goes towards the sun, the light, I believe that the heat and the, the, the nature of the day, it, it pulls apart the cellular body. It pulls that humidity into pieces and that, that's done by heat. So this is this Bardos heat realm. So as we struggle with the nature of being disconnected, not just from our earth, our bodies, but we're also now being disconnected from our air and our water, which is our emotion and our intellectual bodies. Mm -hmm. We're literally pulled apart yeah. and this is the hellfire realm that we cannot deal with and we have to go through all these rationals to dispose of them and eventually of course we come down in the rain or we you know we, we continue and i think maybe consciously at that stage if like a buddhist you can say okay i know this is going to happen then i can decide to go and do something else or i can come back and do such and such but i i, I generally think that as a as a technique that it's worth considering that this is just what happens. It's, it's nothing even too technical that this is what happens. We leave our bodies in these two forms, air and, earth and water, and leave our earth behind. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's a bit hypothetical, but it's uh, it's definitely um, off topic. <laughs> no, no, this is not, that's okay. This is off planet or off topic radio, whichever you prefer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Brilliant. you know, this was a really cool way to kind of tie up some bits. And um, did we get through what you wanted to cover for the most part? Because you know, you're invited back anytime. So. Absolutely. I know we're, we're well over two hours at this stage. You know, and, and, and I also, you know, after you did the singing bowl, um, everything shifted. And I, and I think the listeners will pick this up. You know, I shifted as a result of that. And um, the experience of listening to this audio will be a bit different than the average broadcast in that I think we leave something abiding that they can go back to again because that was for me that was just marvelous being able to sit here and experience what you did with the singing bowl and uh, the um toning was well, no, you're very welcome. i would love to come back uh, um, i'd love to come back on another um another time and if we get a chance i'd love to go through uh the works of oscar kismuth mm. Uh, to another degree, and I'd like to offer um, some theories I've got around microevolution, how and why humans evolved through the theory that he suggests, and uh, again, relating back to Genesis. But also, um, and, and some of that is to do with climatic and geographical. It's, it's very, very physical that mm -hmm. I, I'm 
thesis of and and also then a, a few references again just to bring us into a, a bit more of a historical uh, precept as to why these these ancient cultures had such amazing abilities um, and, and and maybe that'll be another show if if we get the chance yeah, that kind of touches on the Tartaria mud flood reset um, conversation that is quite the rage right now but um, I think there's some important things there. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you're invited back. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you for coming on and presenting what I consider to be a rather unique experience. I'm That's sure true. the um, listeners will appreciate that as well. Uh, we will put your contact links for your Facebook group up with thank the show, you. but if you just want to let people know about that as we go out. So um, it's currently called Evolution or De-Evolution by Friends of Oscar Kismuth. And uh, yeah, it, it, it very much focuses on the topic of modern day and ancient cannibalism. And the theory realistically is not particularly developed in there because <laughs> I'm trying to get a, a bit of conversation going with people. And maybe over time uh, that'll start to happen. So that's uh, Evolution or De-Evolution by Friends of Oscar Kismuth. There you go. All right, Wolf Famous, thanks for coming on. Uh, we wish you well in, in the times ahead. And uh, I know you and I are in touch pretty often, so we will do that. Um, this is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside of you. Um, go experience it. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.